and welcome to Compass Online. Friends, this is kind of fun. I'm not usually in a hosting role, but we are entering a four week period where I take my study break. This is an exciting time where I am able to take a break from preaching and focus instead on preparing the sermons for the whole next 12 months. And so pray for me. It's an important time in your prayers are much appreciated. Are you ready to focus in on the worship of the Lord and then learning from his word? Let's turn to celebrate him. This is my father's word.
The first of our guest preachers is one of our own. It's our pastor, Paul Giersch. Paul's the pastor of support groups, an incredible man of God, friend of mine, and a great preacher. So enjoy. Here's Paul. Well, hello, Compass. Great to be with you today. I just want to say hello to my friends in, at Hinsdale and also those who are be watching online. Some of you watching online might be saying, who is this guy? Well, just to let you know, my name is Paul Gears. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm actually the, the pastor of support groups for Compass. So it's great to be here. Let me pray uh, for myself and for you as I head into our message today. Father, uh, we just thank you for this moment in time. Father, would you do what only you can do during this message? I'm asking you uh, that you would breathe your spirit in and through me. And my prayer is, anyone who listens to this message, that you would open up their heart so that they would hear what you want them to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, we are going to look at the account, and I say account instead of story because it's not a story, it's an account of Jesus walking on the water. In order to unpack this, I will also uh, be using three different gospels. I'll be using Matthew and Mark and John. Let's begin in John chapter 6, verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed out about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. I want to reread 16 and 17. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake. Here's a question. Why did they get into the boat and sail across the lake? Was it to fish? Sightseeing tour. Midnight cruise. To find the answer to that question, let's look at the account written by Matthew. Matthew 14, 22. Here's the answer. He, Jesus, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So the reason that they headed onto the Sea of Galilee to the other side is because Jesus told them to get into the boat and go. Let's go on in Mark. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night... The boat was in the middle of the lake. John told us they were three to four miles out. And he, Jesus, was alone on the land. This next verse is pretty interesting. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And we might say, wait a second. <laughs> Didn't we just read that they were three to four miles out? Yet, the text tells us that Jesus saw them. It's nighttime. It is, let's just say, two in the morning. It's raining. It's storming. It's pitch black. Yet, Jesus saw them three to four miles out. Did he have night vision goggles? Probably not. I mean, even if he had night vision goggles, here's the thing. The curvature of the earth begins at about three miles. 
So even if he had the night vision goggles, he still couldn't see them. Some skeptics might say, well, he was up on the hillside. That's why he could see them. Well, remember, it is pitch black. It is raining sideways, and it's very stormy and wavy. And here's the thing about the Sea of Galilee. The fishermen would say this. It is so dark out there that you could barely see your hand in front of your face. Yet Jesus saw them three to four miles out. Wow. Oh. Here's the answer. It be, it's because Jesus is Adonai Roy. You might say, well, what in the world is that? You see, the Israelites, they had many names for God. And one of them was Adonai Roy, which meant God sees. Just one more piece of compelling evidence that Jesus is, in fact, God. So what does that mean for us? Adonai Roy. What does that mean for us that God sees? Well, what it means for us is every time we think he has forgotten about us, he hasn't. What does that mean for us? Every time we think he's not paying attention and we're doing those things we shouldn't, guess what? He is. <laughs> Adonai Roy. It means when we think that God is taking a day off, he isn't. He's working behind the scenes. He's arranging his perfect plan and plans for the perfect moment. You see, God is always in time, on time, all the time, uh, very rarely on our time. Amen? <laughs> and sometimes the Lord who sees actually sends his disciples or his followers into storms. Not a big fan. Doesn't make it not true, though. <laughs> Mark 6.45 we read this. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now, here's the thing about Jesus, who is God in the flesh. He not only sees all, he knows all. He's omnipotent, which means he knew there was going to be a storm, yet he still sent the disciples into the storm. <laughs> Interesting. Back in 2005, God sent me into a storm. Let me tell you the story. I had been an associate pastor of a church in Bloomingdale. And it is the church I came to know Jesus in. I've been an associate pastor there for three years. And the senior pastor believed that God was calling him to another church. And I have to tell you, I, I was a little excited. And here's why. Because I'm like, I'm the guy. I should be the next senior pastor of this church. And here's what the leadership said. We're going to look around. I'm like, huh. Well, I'm going to look around then. And, and I found a job in... Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at a church and a school. And Laura, my wife, actually was hired uh, to be uh, the office manager for the pastor. We believed that God called us 100% to Baton Rouge. So in early August of 2005, we moved to Baton Rouge. On August 29th of 2005, Something happened down there. Anyone want to take a stab? Hurricane Katrina. I would consider that a storm. Baton Rouge is 60 miles northwest of New Orleans. Now, Baton Rouge did not get uh, hit like New Orleans did, but it was hit pretty hard. 
Enough that we had a tree on our house for probably three months. Baton Rouge was, was the first safe town where evacuees from New Orleans came to seek shelter. On August 30th, our church and, and school, we put a sign out that said, shelter. And very quickly, 150 evacuees out of New Orleans were on our property. Uh, people came only with their cars. They came with their animals. And when I say animals, I mean every possible, imaginable animal you could think of. I mean lizards, crocodiles, they had horses, dogs, cats, birds, I don't know, everything. In fact, our football field had horses on it. They brought everything and the clothes on their back. Some of them, when they got to us, were still wet, having escaped the flooding from Lake Pontchartrain. Now, people back home said to me, I can't believe that God would send you into a hurricane. And other people said, well, it doesn't look like God called you, does it? <laughs> Looks like you made a big mistake. And at first, I was buying that. I'm like, yeah, this, this, is, uh, this isn't fun. This is not what <laughs> I signed up for. But as I began to look back, I, I began to realize that God actually did send me to that storm. When I left New Life Church for Baton Rouge, you see, I believed 100% that I was ready to be a lead pastor. I believed I was ready to be the guy, right? But God knew I wasn't. He sent me to a hurricane in order to train me how to be a pastor. You see, I hadn't yet learned the importance of the ministry of presence to just be with people and not be a big shot pastor. He taught me how to just cry with people and be with people and not even have the answers for people. No eloquent words, no words of wisdom, no nuggets, no preaching. Just crying with people and loving on people. You see, God sent me into a storm to prepare me to be a pastor. Another thing that I learned in the midst of that storm was how God can miraculously meet people's needs in the midst of a storm. When we opened that shelter, we had no idea what was going to happen, how many people were going to come. We had limited finances. We had little food, no clothing, two showers, no bedding, not to mention no power, and it's 95 degrees in Louisiana. If you've ever been there, it's hot. And yet, during this time that we, we took care of these evacuees, not one person went hungry. Not one person went without clothes. God provided incredible amount of finances. Every day, Laura would go to our mailbox and there would be cash or checks. I mean, a lot of cash and a lot of checks. I mean, I, I walked around like a big shot with this big wad of money. And when I saw somebody in need, I gave them money. You know, there were times that some of the vehicles broke down and I remember pulling over and the guy's like, I can't get this fixed. And I just gave him, I don't know, 400 bucks. God was providing finances for these people. They had nothing. You couldn't even get to the ATMs because they were empty. God reunited families at our shelter. It was amazing what would happen. We'd have these people at our shelter and they didn't know where their families were and then these family members would show up at our shelter. 
God miraculously over and over and over showed who he was. People invited strangers into their house to stay with them. Laura and I did that. If you know me, that's not really like me. But God was on the move. This person had a dog and cats and all kinds of stuff. I'm like, okay, whatever. Houses were built and donated to provide homes for some of the evacuees. Families whose houses were absolutely destroyed and they could never go back. What happened with them? They were flown all over the, over, all over the country by flight angels, free of charge. And one might think during this crisis... You know, the pain and suffering that these people were, were going through, you would think that most of them, if not all of them, would say, why God? Well, that's not what happened. During this period of time, I've never seen so many people come to know Jesus as their Savior and trust him as their Lord. Amen. Amen. You see, sometimes God send us in, sends us into storms to prepare us for our future. And sometimes God sends us into storms to reveal his power so that we will trust him for the storms of our future. Because storms always come, don't they? And God wants to prepare us for the storms that are ahead. In his book titled The Grave Robber, Mark Batterson, pastor and author, wrote, most of us prefer smooth sailing. However, that's often sailing away from the miraculous. He goes on to say, sometimes the prerequisite for a miracle is the perfect storm. Wow. So as the disciples struggled on that lake, they didn't know, but they were about to experience the miraculous. We read, as Jesus was on the mountainside, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. The disciples are straining. They're beaten by the waves. They're worn out. It seemed they were fighting a losing battle. They're powerless. They're helpless. They're barely hanging on. And then they saw Jesus approaching the boat. But, but the reaction of them isn't what we think. It says they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and it says that they were afraid. In another version, it says they were terrified. In another version, it said that they saw a ghost and they were terrified. They didn't know it was him. Remember, it's dark, and all they can see is a silhouette against the land. You see, the disciples were afraid because what they saw was outside of their reality. In John 6, 20, as Jesus comes closer, he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. The disciples had never seen anything like this. They had never imagined that Jesus, even Jesus, could walk on the water. And that's why Jesus said, it is I, it is I, don't be afraid. Faith is not denying reality. Faith is recognizing that there is a reality beyond our perception beyond what we can see. You see, Jesus wants us to understand and recognize that he operates far beyond what we perceive. Let me go back for a moment to my Katrina experience. As those evacuees kept pouring into our parking lot, I mean literally one after another, after another, after another. I remember standing out in front of the church with the senior pastor and saying this, I'm afraid. And also saying, 
there is no way possible that we're gonna be able to do this. You know, I believe in Jesus and everything, but this one, completely impossible. There's no way that we can minister to these people. Not this number of people. Yet, as I told you, the Lord provided time and time and time again. He operated far beyond my perception. And he continues to operate far beyond our perception. And Jesus also desires us to turn to him in times of fear. Again, John 6, 20, he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Jesus is saying, replace your fear with faith and trust in me. That night on that lake, Jesus was telling the disciples, put me in between your fear and your fear will flee. Fear is allowing circumstances, false assumptions, and projections. Do we have any projectors here? You see, fear is allowing our projections to get in between us and Jesus. Faith or trust in Jesus is putting him in between the circumstances, the false assumptions, and our projections. In 1 John chapter 4, I love this verse. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. There is only one act of perfect love that ever happened. And that was when Jesus went to the cross for us. You see, he sacrificed his love for us so that we could be reconciled to God, so we could be forgiven by our sins, and so that we could be with him for eternity. If he did that, I mean, I'm asking myself as well as all of you, if he did that, can we trust him in every single circumstance? I'm going with yes. I'm not saying I do, but yes. The answer is yes. Maybe if Jesus was here, he he might say, it is I. (laughs) Let my love drive out your fear. All right. So far in this passage, here's what we've learned. Jesus sees all. Sometimes Jesus will send his followers into a storm. We've learned that he operates far beyond our perception We've learned that Jesus wants us to turn to him in times of fear. There's something else we can learn from this passage. Some miracles can only happen away from the shore. Could Jesus walk on the water while they were standing on the shore? No. Up to this time, there'd been magicians, sorcerers, And they've wowed people with illusion, magic tricks, sleight of hand, but no one, not one of them had walked on the water, let alone walking three to four miles on the water at night in a storm. This is not a prophet. This is not a good man. This is not a good teacher. Jesus is God in the flesh. And that night, Jesus provided a miracle of monumental proportion. He walked on the water. And this miracle, it could not be, you know, like, ah, uh, not really. No. No, it happened. It couldn't be explained away. It couldn't be chalked up to coincidence. It couldn't be explained that it was a ghost or a mirage. That night, Jesus walked on the water for three, maybe four miles, which means that he walked on the water for approximately 70 minutes in a storm at night. And now the disciples were able to say, not only can he turn water to wine, 
Not only could he heal the deaf, not only could he heal the leper, not only could he feed 15,000 with two fish and five biscuits, he can walk on water. Friends, some miracles can only happen away from the shore. And it was during this miracle that another miracle happened. And you're probably thinking it and you're knowing it. Yeah, yeah. Peter walked on the water. <laughs> Could Peter have walked on the water had they been on the shore? Nope. Some miracles can only happen away from the shore. Maybe some of you are here today and you are too attached to the shore. The Lord is prompting you to let go of the rope that holds you to the shore of comfort and you're hanging on tight. Friends, some miracles can only happen away from the shore. Maybe the Lord is calling you to let go of your old life so you could start living your new one in Christ. Maybe the Lord is, is prompting you to let go of your will so that you could operate in his will. Maybe the Lord is prompting you, he's calling you to let go of that relationship. And I'm not talking about marriages, but to let go of that relationship that's holding you to the shore. Maybe the Lord is calling you to release that loved one that you're trying to control, to release that loved one so that he could do what he needs to do in their life. Maybe the Lord is calling you to let go of control, not that we would have any control freaks in here. Let go of control so that he could be the Lord of your life. Maybe the Lord is calling you to let go of that substance or that emotion that has held you captive. Maybe he's calling you to let go so that you can experience the freedom in Christ. Maybe the Lord is calling you to let go of the comfort of your weekend seat to serve in a ministry here. And you could take that step tonight. You could pull that connection card out, fill it out and say, I want to serve. We'll get back to you. Maybe the Lord is calling you to lead a ministry, to start a business, to leave a business. I don't know. But I do know this, that some miracles can only happen away from the shore. As we begin to, to close, I want to go back to John 6, 19 through 21. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Whoa. Maybe you're here today and Jesus is your savior, but you are in a storm. Maybe you're here today and you're in this storm and you are trying in your own strength to get to the shore. Maybe it's time to take Jesus into the boat with you. He might calm the storm. He might bring you to the shore immediately. He also might provide for you the supernatural sense of peace so that you can continue to go through the storm. Back in 1996, I would say that I was in a storm. I would say that it was a storm that I created and maybe it was a storm that God allowed. Who knows? 
but I was in a storm. I was lost at sea. <laughs> I was struggling to stay afloat. And Jesus was at best a silhouette <laughs> to me on the horizon. I mean, I knew of him, but I didn't, I didn't know him. I had lost everything to an alcohol and drug addiction. I remember talking to a friend and saying to this friend, I don't know what to do. He said, I, I, I have the solution. Awesome. Jesus. He said, go in your house tonight, get on your knees and ask Jesus for help. And I said, what the H at that time? What he was saying is, why don't you invite Jesus into your boat? And I did. That night I, in, I invited Jesus into my boat and here's what happened that night. I reached the shore immediately. He removed the compulsion to drink and I never drank again. You know, sometimes we hear stories like that, I'm like, whoa, man, that's incredible, that's so cool. Of course it is. That happens with Jesus. When we invite him into the boat, when we're lost, when we're flailing at sea, when we invite him into the boat, we reach the shore immediately sometimes. And maybe you're here today. And maybe you, you know of Jesus, but you don't know him, let alone you haven't invited him into your boat so that he could bring you to the shore, so that he could forgive you, so that he could wipe your slate clean, so that he could hit the restart button on your life, and so you could be reconciled to the God that you've been rebelling against. Maybe, just maybe, the God of the universe has caused that storm for this moment in time so that you could place your faith in Jesus so your sins could be forgiven and you could be reconciled to the Father so that he can lead you to the shore and so your life will mean something and you'll be valued and you will have purpose. If that's you today, and you are ready to invite Jesus into the boat, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You could just close your eyes right where you are, and I'm gonna lead a prayer. And if you're ready tonight to invite him into the boat, Here's a prayer that I can help you with. Jesus, I'm sorry. I have, I've rebelled against you. I've sinned against you. I've, I've even talked horrible about you. I have broken your laws and I'm sorry. And thank you, Jesus, that you came to earth. You loved me so much with that perfect love. You came to earth. You died on a cross. You took my sins to the grave and you're resurrected without them. Thank you. Would you forgive me? Jesus, today, I want to invite you into the boat because I want to reach the shore. I want a life of purpose and value and peace. Please forgive me and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thank you for joining us at Compass Online. And this is a chance for me just to remind you that we'd love to know about you. You could 
click the connection card and let us know that you're a regular part of our online ministry. Also want to say a huge thanks to all of you who give financially. Your generosity is being used to impact thousands of lives for Christ. So thank you much. And make sure that you join us next week. One of my friends, Pastor Derek Puckett from Renewal Church in Chicago. He's a church planter who has great, great impact. You won't want to miss Derek next week. God bless and we'll see you everyone.